The following interview was conducted with Dr. Robert E. Hannum, an MD for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, uh, April the 7th. Uh, 17th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, uh, I was born in Hammond, Indiana, the, just a city in the northern part of the state. I uh, grew up in Hammond. Uh, there was a short interval where I uh, mo was moved with my parents, of course, uh, to California for a couple of years, but then we came back to Hammond, and so my whole early life essentially was in Hammond, Indiana. Okay. Do you have any any siblings? And tell yeah, us about your early years. Going sure. To I had a school. twin brother uh, and then uh, two sisters, two older sisters. So, so you and your brother are the youngest? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And then tell us a little bit about high school and uh, any athletics or student organizations where you went to high school? Yeah. Well, I th first thought I'll let you know about the grade school. I went to Good. a two-room grade school. It was a Lutheran school, uh, the same school building that my father went to. And his father had established that church in North Hammond. So it was a two-room school, total of about uh, 30 students, maybe 35, 40 at the most. Uh, but then from there went to uh, Clark High School, which was a new high school in the northern part of the city, the extreme north of the city, bordering Lake Michigan, and right next to the uh, Whiting, city of Whiting, which was right next to the refinery. So I grew up next to the refineries, which is significant. About, we'll talk about that later. But. Oh, go ahead. That's all right. So anyway, uh, yeah, in, in, in high school, though, uh, I was active, uh, tried sports for a while, and uh, this led to, uh, since I wasn't that good in sports, led to uh, other things which happened to be a sports reporter on the uh, newspaper in school. And then I got involved with stu student government and was vice president of the class, vice president of the student council and we formed a new organization at that time called the Student Panel, which was a disciplinary organization. So the students were to judge misbehavior of other students, and then you had this panel that would judge what the punishment should be, if there should be any, and that sort of thing. So that was a new concept. It was sort of student self-discipline, uh, peer discipline is right. what it amounted to. Good. So that was, uh, you know, the high school different. career. Yeah. So, and then you went from high school. You uh, went to college and came to Purdue. Yeah, uh, the high school about? experience and living next to the refineries and being from an industrially oriented area. And my father worked in uh, different factories. He was a machinist and a tool and die maker. Uh, sort of, you leaned directly toward industry. Although I did get interested in journalism and. Uh, the story as far as counseling, I think I may have related to you before, but the counseling was rather slim at that time, and I did talk to the journalism instructor in high school. He taught a pretty good course, uh, and I was, you know, editor, sports editor of the newspaper along with my brother, uh, and he said, you know, you do write pretty well. He said, you do a pretty good job, he said, but you can't make any money in journalism. He said, you should be an engineer. He said, I work for Standard Oil during the summer months, he said, those engineers make a lot of money. So well, that was a little incentive. And then when I went to the counselor before going to or deciding where I would go to school, I had a qualified for a state scholarship. Uh, and I had ranked fairly high in some of the other scholarship tests. And um, the counselor said, uh, let me see, good in math, good in chemistry, good in biology. He said, you should be an engineer. You should go to Purdue, he said, and I've got the state scholarship forms. I know you'll qualify for that. He said, and we might be able to get some other scholarships. He said, okay, and he wrote it down. He said, engineering, Purdue University. He said, okay, next. And so that, that was the sum total of the counseling. It took about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. So uh, that's how I ended up uh, you know, at Purdue. And, uh, what year did you enter Purdue? Entered Purdue in 48, Okay. Uh, which was a a very busy year uh, as far as the return of veterans. Uh, housing was really scarce. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit. Yeah, about the it. housing, uh, we came down here, my brother and I, to look for a place to live. Completely inexperienced. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and there was no place to live. Some of the, uh, quote, apartments were really, uh, you know, we didn't live real high on the hog, but this was worse than any place I had ever seen or lived in. And they were renting those uh, for more money than we could afford anyway. So uh, what about residence halls? Weren't there the residence halls were here? full, 
And so, but I went to the, uh, since I had the state scholarship, uh, I went to the scholarship office and there was a lady by the name of Jean Harvey there and she was really nice. Uh, and she said, um, what seems to be the trouble? I said, well, you know, we've got these scholarships and they're good at either IU or Purdue, but we can't find a place to live. We'd like to come to Purdue, you know, we can't find a place to live. Uh, and she said, oh, that's really bad. And she said, just a moment. And she was in the president's office, right outside the president's office. The scholarship offices, and she did a, lots of jobs, uh, was in the same, it was in Hovday Hall, that what's now Hovday. And uh, she said, just a minute. And she picked up the phone and she said, John, she said, I have two students here, scholarship holding students, that are threatening to go to IU because they can't find a place to live. And uh, so she said, okay, okay, okay. Then she hung up the phone. She said, now you're going to walk down the street here, and there's a place called Cary Hall. And she said, it's not very far, but a block away. And when you get there, you go up to some floor or something, and John Gantz is there. And John Gantz was the director of the Cary Hall at that time. And I didn't know that. Uh, so I went up there, and he said, oh, it seems like you guys have a little trouble finding a place to live. He said, we can find some place for you. He said, it won't be real nice, uh, but he said it'll be clean and it'll be in Cary Hall. I said, well, that's not too bad. So uh, that's what we got. When we went up to look at where we were going to stay, it was the fourth floor of the attic of Cary Hall West. And they had converted the attic into dormitories. There were about 30 bunks, single bunks, which was better than some of the other places that had double bunks. Single bunks lined up on two sides of this big uh, room and then there were uh, makeshift lockers in between and they had constructed some bathroom facilities on each end of this so there were probably uh, eight or ten commodes uh, all open just like the army in uh, open sinks and uh, uh, a couple of showers and what have you and he said this is uh, but he said this is only temporary only temporary he said a lot of students come to Purdue and then they leave and as they leave, their rooms empty up, and he said, we'll get you, you know, down. Uh, we were up there for the whole semester, or the whole year, not the whole semester, the whole year. Uh, so, but when we, uh, to go back to Jean Harvey, because I owe her a lot, uh, when I, we came back to her office and, uh, you know, said, okay, well, we've got a place to live now. She said, oh, that's fine. She said, you know, she said, I've been looking over your records. She said, could you guys use a little more money? He, she said, I noticed there's two of you, in, and I don't know if they put the income, father's income down or not, but she he said, um, could you use a little more money? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can use money. And she said, well, I've got some alumni scholarships here that will help pay for your books and that sort of thing. I think the uh, tuition uh, was covered by the state scholarship. But there was nothing for books and uh, nothing for room and board. So whatever the amount was, it was sure, you know, worthwhile. So we held then also an alumni scholarship the whole time. So that was really, she was really helpful. And, you know, it makes me feel bad that I'm not sure that I ever went back and thanked her about that. Oh, that's okay. But she no. was... Um, uh, she was like an assistant to the prison. She actually had a PhD, and I uh, I looked it up one time, and uh, it was in education or something. And I think she uh, continued working for Hovday probably as long as he was here. Hmm. But I, I really never really looked her up again, and right. probably should have. Okay. What did you major in when you were here? <clears throat> uh, chemical engineering. Okay. So it started out in general engineering, and then uh, was attracted to chemical engineering because actually I had done well in chemistry and was interested in, in sure. chemistry. so, And that was uh, something that would aim you toward the oil industry. And uh, we were heavily influenced by the oil industry. Right, yeah. That's a big plant. Yeah. Whiting is a big operation. Yeah, it was yeah. Standard Oil at the right, time. Right, and it was, yeah. uh, you know, it was impressive. And they did take you on field trips and treated you very well, you know, when you were looking for a job and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it, uh, it was impressive, and uh, that's what directed you at that time. What was the campus like? There weren't as many buildings as there were now. And did oh, you no. stay in the care? What did you do after the first year? Did, were you there? Did you join a fraternity? Yeah, or? No, we uh, uh, moved into Cary Hall West, I think, uh, you know, uh, in the regular rooms, which were all doubled up. 
So these were single rooms that had been made into double rooms. So they had double deck bunks and they had one closet in there uh, that you had to share and then they just put two desks in there. There's just about enough room to to move around, you know, uh, and uh, you didn't uh, bring much stuff. Well, we didn't have very much at that time, mm. so you, all your clothing was in the one closet. Sure. Two guys. Yeah. Uh, and so we were there for a year or maybe two and then went over to Southwest. I think we uh, were the, in Southwest, Cary Southwest, uh, when we were juniors and seniors. Now those rooms were still doubled up rooms, but they were a little bigger over sure, there. Sure, right. So good. that uh, made it better. Good. So, and yeah. then after and you graduated in what year? In 1952. Kennedy. Okay, and then <clears throat> what went on? Tell us what went on next. Well, uh, let me finish at mm -hmm. Purdue when I was okay. here because uh, okay. uh, when I was going through uh, the um, uh, reception or the registration lines, at that time it was hand registration. Uh, and you, it was in the armory, and they had big desks lined up all the way down the line, and you would go in there, and they, uh, some of it was alphabetized, and they would have um, uh, your the H, as you know, so Hanman was under H, and you got some cards, and then uh, they had a curriculum that you had to fill out, and you'd pick up cards for classes. They were doing some card sorting at that time, I think. Um, so you knew what courses you had to take, so it would be math such and such, and so you'd go, here's the math desk, and you'd uh, look up math such and such. And somebody usually was there to help you and say, well, that section is full, but you can take this section. It's at the same time or a different time or whatever it was. And you had to work out your own schedule, so obviously you couldn't schedule two classes at the same time. But you had a set number of classes and hours that you had to take. So it was essentially a 20-hour semester. Uh, you graduated from Purdue as a chemical engineer with 169 hours. So that was four, you know, four years or eight semesters uh, followed uh, by one semester, one summer school, because you had to take that to get the laboratory courses in in chemical engineering. Okay. So your number of hours were 169 hours. Okay, that's quite, a, that's quite a bit. 20 a semester, you know, for right. those, so eight semesters and plus the summer school. So you had to juggle things around and fit it in there. But while I was going through those different lines and trying to get things, there was an activities area or activities desk. And you had to, the freshman had to go through there. Uh, you couldn't get out of it. And so you went through there and the guys, they had your card, your activity card that they got from somewhere. He said, oh, you've been a, a sports editor, newsman. How would you like to be a sports reporter on the exponent? So. I get it. What's the exponent? You know, he said, "It's the newspaper, and you can be a sports reporter, and you've done that in high school. You should do something extra." I said, "Well, okay, sign us up." So, so we signed up, and uh, that we did the whole time we were here. The two of you. Yeah. So we ended, you know, started as sports reporters. You had to take a test, be a, to be a sports reporter. The sports editor, a guy by the name of Bill Bones, at that time, uh, he uh, gave a test. You know, this was the rules of baseball, the rules of football, uh, and ter a lot of terminology, you know, uh, slang terms, sports terms, you know, various, uh, and sports figures, so you had to know a certain amount. I don't know that he ever graded it, but it was really a lengthy test. Uh, and then um, see if you were qualified to be a sports reporter. And then uh, from then on, you know, we uh, were a reporter for a couple of years, became, by the time we were juniors, we uh, became associate sports editors, and then we were, during the summer we were here, uh, this is probably out of desperation, maybe on their part, I don't know. They made us sport, co-sports editors for the summer exponent. Uh, and, and I think the uh, senior year, I think we were just maybe writing feature articles or something like that. Because everybody had to move up, you know, their ranks. And so I got my gold, you know, key for being a, a sports editor though, so. Uh, but that, you know, that writing, I had always enjoyed writing and liked sure. writing, so uh, that was just, that was the major extracurricular uh, activity uh, that You didn't I get did. paid though, did you? No, no, no. no, no. Students it was now a, do. It was a tough job because uh, the newspaper was a full-size newspaper uh, and uh, it was put out, uh, it wasn't put out on Monday, so it was every day except Monday, uh, or Sunday, Sunday and Monday. Uh, and so you would, there were five issues a week and uh, there was one editor in charge of each issue. 
So five, one of those five nights, uh, you were on call. That meant you had to take the articles that were written by the reporters, you put them all together and put them on a page, and you went down to the Haywood Publishing Company on uh, the east side of town, uh, and they typeset it uh, for you. And boy, those guys were sticklers. I mean, if it was their error, they would correct it and not say anything. But they didn't make very many errors. But if it was your error and you <laughs> wanted them to change it, it, it was really tough. You, you really had to be nice to those guys because this stuff was all, you know, linotype. Sure, right. And, you know, they had to uh, type another line, take out the line that this mistake was in, replace that. And they didn't like to do that. I don't blame them, you know. But... Uh, they would do it after you got to know them a little bit, but they sure didn't like to do it very often. And you re you proofread stuff real carefully before you gave it to them, because you didn't want if it was their error, they would you know you they they replace it. But if it's yours, that's your fault. You know we're not going to do that. So <laughs> anyway, but that uh, that you know that was the you know we did a lot of uh, work with the sports uh, staff. You know a lot of interviewing, a lot of. Did you do uh, any travel with the teams? No, oh. uh, no, but, uh, well, in, I mean, on our own, you know, we would go down to like the Indiana game where, uh, and we did get to go uh, uh, during the summer, at the end of the summer, I think the All-Star game, uh, the college All-Star, maybe, yeah, there were no pros at the time, so it was a college-type All-Star game uh, that was held in Chicago at Soldier's Field. Arch Ward, the sports editor for the Chicago Tribune, um, that's another story. Uh, I had written an editorial about uh, uh, Chancellor Hutchins at the University of Chicago. Uh, this was in the summer edition of The Exponent. At that time, he was advocating the elimination of all college athletics because he thought it was a waste of time, money, and talent, and everything else. And I just wrote a, um, uh, I was defending, it was, it was something like in defense of college athletics or college sports. Uh, and he apparently had picked up on that in some way. Anyway, sooner or later, we he got in touch with us, or uh, and there were me rather, and uh, wanted to know who wrote that and what have you. And then, uh, you know, I, we got talking about the All Star Game, and he said, "I can send you a couple tickets to the All Star Game." So we did. They have two of us, my brother and I, uh, and uh, the uh, that editorial uh, caused a little bit of a stir. Uh, on the campus because there were a lot of phone calls apparently that came in. Uh, some of them ended up in the athletic director's office uh, and he wasn't too impressed by that. Uh, but, uh, you know, because it was criticizing a, you know, a nationally known figure and he was very uh, prominent in his criticism of sports, college sports. I mean, it was all over the, the country. So here's this college newspaper that's coming out with a with an editorial, uh, you know, written by some young guy about uh, defending college athletics. Sure. So, but anyway, that uh, uh, that was my introduction to controversy and what have you. So, <laughs> on a national level. Uh, so, but you got to the All Star game. It worked out. It was okay. Yeah, it worked out sure. fine. Yeah, All right. I got to go to the All Star game, and uh, then yeah. the everything worked out. You know, worked out well. Okay. Now, now that you've, you're finished, and what was your career path before your affiliation with Purdue? Well, you know, I, uh, first thing you do is look for a job. Uh, there, we interviewed, but there was nowhere near the kind of interviewing that is done now. It was here, but very, very low scale. There probably, we uh, probably interviewed three, four companies. That's about all. Uh, there was Sinclair uh, Refining or for Sinclair Research, uh, DuPont. Uh, and uh, the Standard Oil, there were a couple of the major companies were here. There was a, a jet assist takeoff company, Jato, and uh, those sort of things getting started into the jet uh, engine type thing. Uh, but there were very few jobs. And so uh, what happened was the, uh, uh, we got out of here, we didn't have a job. So we just, we lived in North Hammond. So if you go into uh, Hammond and then Whiting, and you start walking down Indianap what's called Indianapolis Boulevard, there's just sort of one refinery after another. So there was Shell, there was Mobil, there was Standard Oil, uh, Sinclair. Uh, there were just one, there were probably six, seven 
refineries, right? You know, just walked right down uh, that street. So we just started walking down the street. We hit, uh, I think, Mobile or Shell first, and then hit the Shell or Mobile second. Um, and you, you interviewed them, they gave you some tests and what have you. But the Purdue name got you in very quick. I mean, they, at least you got in the door. And they would say, oh, geez, you know, we just don't have anything now. But, you know, we got your name on file and that sort of thing. We hit Sinclair, and this guy uh, was really this, uh, he was the head of engineering. And uh, he came in and his, had his sleeves rolled up and uh, no, no air conditioning at that time. And he said, um, where are you guys from? They said, uh, from Purdue. He said, oh. He said, uh, let me look at your records. He said, okay, okay. When can you start? So <laughs> he said, well, as soon as we can. He said, how about Monday? I mean, this was like Friday or Thursday or something like that. He said, how about next Monday? He said, we'll get all the paperwork done and that sort of thing. Uh, he said, you know, we're in the process of enlarging this refinery. He used the figures of how much they were going to enlarge it. We've got to redo a whole bunch of the piping and the distillation things and all of that. He said, you guys know all about that, don't you? I said, oh, sure, sure. We know that. And so that's uh, what we did. started working. I, now, when I started there, they put you first in the what they called the inspection department. And the, there was a, a, a respect, a, not a grudging respect, but a uh, kind of a respect among the staff people there, the working, you know, the uh, refinery workers about, uh, you know, they'd kid you about being a young engineer, didn't know anything. But the Purdue name, you know, it did mean something to them, you know, uh, that that was significant that you were from uh, Purdue. Uh, so uh, anyway, it, uh, you know, they gave you a variety of jobs and uh, everything from, you know, inspecting the inside of uh, tanks, uh, these storage tanks, all the way to my favorite job was I was uh, given a crew of three or four and I was supposed to take, they had a power boat, a real nice power boat, uh, and they were on a canal and was to go uh, up and down this canal and sample the water at different levels to see how much contaminant was being put in, not only by us, uh, and we were at the tail end of the canal, but by everybody else, so Shell, Sinclair, I mean Shell and Mobile and all the others. Uh, and we were just sampling the water in each area, and then we just turned in the water to the state, uh, and they would sample it to see who's putting out most of the contaminants, and most of it had to do with phenol and, and oil itself and what have you. Uh, it was a pretty dirty canal at that time. But then, you know, after we got done, we'd get out to the end of the canal and the guys would say, well, what time is it? Well, it's fairly early. We'll just tell you, maybe we should check what's going on a little further out, you know. So we'd take a little ride out into the lake, you know, and come back. So uh, that was my favorite uh, job, you know. So, they could go for a cruise. <clears throat> yeah, just a little bit of a cruise. But um, the, probably the, uh, from a Purdue relationship, uh, had to do with a, uh, there was an inspection uh, uh, thing on one weekend, or right before a weekend, uh, where they um, had a tank uh, that needed to be uh, worked on, uh, I mean, it had been worked on, it was for uh, sulfuric acid or something, it was a lead line tank. And so uh, the uh, inspector that uh, had been assigned to inspect that, uh, he had looked at it and then he said, well, just do this. Uh, I'm leaving, you can just check this, and they can start filling it this weekend. And so I, uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of the workmen came and said, you know, there's a, a leak uh, in this uh, this area uh, here of this tank. Uh, he said, it's a real small one, but he said, that, you know, they had a vacuum type thing they put on it. And the, so yeah, there, so they put a little soap on there and you get this little bubble form. So uh, I went in there and I said, you know, that's, you know, that needs to be, fixed because we can't pass it the way it is, even though it's probably not going to do any harm. So I said, have you still got your lead thing, your lead welder? And uh, I, he said, yeah. And I said, okay, why don't you bring that over here? And he said, I said, I'll show you how to do that. So this guy brought that over and I, he said, uh, how do you do that? And I said, well, you just take that thing and you just make that little bead over here like that. And I said, so he went ahead and did it. He was a workman I couldn't do. I couldn't even carry a wrench. Uh, because I was, uh, but anyway, he just did that. He said, how's that look? And I said, oh, it's pretty good to me. I said, let's test it again. So it tested, worked fine. He said, 
where'd you learn how to do that? And I said, we learned that at Purdue. That was part of what we had to take, you know, heat treating, welding, all kinds of welding, including lead welding. So uh, that uh, was one, one of the practical things that was learned at Purdue that most other people were probably not teaching. Uh, so they told you had to actually, at Purdue, you had to make uh, the final test on lead welding. You made a little lead bottle. Uh, so it was four squares, four rectangles rather, and a bottom and the top and a little round piece on top. Uh, and then you had to put that under water pressure through this opening at the top. And if there was any leaks, of course, it's going to come spraying all over the place. And that was always, you know, kind of hilarious because they'd be, okay, who's ready to have their bottles tested? They'd put them on, be water spraying <laughs> here and there and what have you. So, but that was uh, part of the practical approach. You know, we had to take um, heat treating, welding, air conditioning, uh, surveying, uh, mechanical drawing. So you had to take all of those in that first year. And they put that all one right after the other. Oh. It was a lot of practical approach. Uh, sure. You know, you had to be able to do all those things. Mm -hmm. So that's not done anymore. So no, no. changed. Right. right. Uh, so, you know, that was that. Um, you know, I had a lot of good experiences there at Sinclair. It was a good um, uh, job, you know, as far as learning. But also, it paid more money than I had ever. Uh, I think it was three hundred and fifty-nine dollars a month. Uh, two years, uh, well then I, uh, you know, had, prior to that I had decided I'd like to go to medical school and I had, I had uh, entertained those thoughts. So while I was working at Sinclair, I also had an opportunity to go to school and pick up a lot of courses, all the courses I needed for pre-med. So uh, when I uh, picked up most of those courses, uh, there was one left and that one was uh, embryology and nobody taught that up there. Uh, so I had to go to um, Roosevelt College in Chicago to pick that up. And that um, uh, was the end of my uh, civilian life because as soon as I, uh, I had to quit my job to do that, and as soon as I did that, uh, within two weeks, three weeks, they drafted me into the Army. That was right at the end of the Korean War. Uh, and uh, so I went in the Army. Uh, but I did get, I, I got four of the six weeks of that course in, and the instructor uh, said, you know, he said, I like the way you've organized your, uh, this course, the taking this course. He said, you made sketches of stuff, which was part of the engineering background. I made sketches of everything, all these little slide sections and that sort of thing. He said, would you mind if I used your sketches for my lab book that I'm putting together for the lab in this course? And I said, no, that's fine. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, even though you haven't taken the final and you've only completed four of the six weeks, he said, I'll give you a passing grade. I'll give you a C in this course. And I needed that to get into medical school. So, so I did that. So there was then the two years in the Army um, was a, you know, a break uh, in my education. But... Um, when I got in the Army, the chemical engineering played a part, though, because when I got in there, uh, they did a lot of interviewing. Uh, and whoever said the armed services or the government isn't smart, they were very smart. I didn't realize how smart until I figured out what they were doing. And as you were going through, they were particularly interested in uh, people who had a scientific background, particularly engineers. And I thought, I wonder why they're doing that, you know. And they'd go through, they'd say, okay, Where'd you go to college, soldier? Okay, you'd tell him, say, Purdue, okay. Purdue Engineering? Yeah. Okay, you're okay. And somebody else come along and say, where did you go? I went to Tri-State or someplace else. Uh, and uh, they'd say, well, just tell me, where is that? And what kind of, you know, place is that? And what kind of program they do they have? And uh, But if you said Purdue, you just went, uh, you know, went through the line. So then that kept up. Uh, I went through basic training uh, down at Fort Knox and uh, at the, after all of that, and they were doing a lot of uh, clearance, security clearance, and my mother called me when I was basic training and said, are you in trouble of some kind? And I said, why? She said, you know, the FBI's been around and they've been questioning the neighbors and what have you. Well, they were clearing us for top secret clearance. 
Uh, and so I said, no, I'm not in trouble. I said, I'm still in the Army. I'm, not, I mean, I'm in basic training. But uh, I ended up then uh, in what was called the Scientific and Professional Personnel Program. And what they did was take uh, engineers with at least one year of experience and they put them in arsenals around the country because they couldn't get really enough people to work as engineers in those arsenals. They weren't paying anywhere near as much as industry was and that kind of thing. So uh, it was uh, two years of engineering experience. Uh, we weren't getting paid engineering wages. We, I was a private, I ended up being a corporal. They promoted you as fast as they could, but I ended up being a corporal. Uh, and uh, it was two years of, of good industrial experience. But at the, in the same time, I you know, tried to keep as, up as much as possible on the stuff I would need for medical school. And, so, uh, and I had been actually accepted in medical school before I went into the Army. Uh, and uh, you know, I tried to appeal that, or they just said, you've been deferred because of your education and because of your job in an essential industry. No more deferments. And so anyway, uh, when I came out, I went, it came out then on the GI Bill and could go to, to medical school after I got out of the Army. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up uh, in there. So that's the, that's the long story, the long version. That's very good. Yeah. At IU, at IU Medical School. Yeah, right. I went to IU. At that time, the first year was down in Bloomington. And then the next three years were in uh, Indianapolis. Okay. And then I did my pediatric residency at Riley Hospital. I did an internship at Methodist Hospital and then two years uh, of uh, at Riley Hospital. Okay. Now, before we talk about Purdue, how did you happen to, to move to Lafayette, though? You might As, want to share it for the researchers I am yeah. to come here. Well, <laughs> the, uh, you know, uh, that, that's another interesting story. Uh, I was looking for a place to practice. Uh, this was in, in my second year of my residency, and a, a friend of mine uh, was a neurology resident, and he was looking for a place to practice. And he said, you know, there's an opportunity there in Lafayette. He said, could you ride up there with me? He said, I don't know anything about Lafayette in that area. He said, could you ride up there? He said, we'll get a free meal. So I said, how will we get a free meal? He said, well, the County Medical Society is meeting uh, that night. And the doctor that had invited him said, you can just come here and get a free steak. And we were uh, out at uh, the trails. And so I said, fine, you know, for a free meal, I can get a free ride. He's paying for the gas. So uh, we came up here. But while I was there in, at that meeting, uh, they actually had kind of a, an open bar. You could get a bottle of beer or something like that. And I was standing there, and uh, this doctor came up to me, and he said, um, he said, I understand uh, you're a pediatrician or you're in your pediatric training. And I said, yeah, that's right. He said, do you ever think of coming to Lafayette to practice? And I said, no. He said, you know, I'm with an organization called the Arnett Clinic. And I had never heard of that. Uh, I've later on found out that I actually had done some summer work uh, when I was a student, an engineering student, uh, for one of the doctors there. I'd worked in his yard and that sort of thing. Um, but he said, why don't you come and talk to us about that? He said, uh, you'd be, uh, might be interested. He said, you know, he said, we don't have a pediatric department. He said, we're building a new building. Uh, he said, you could help design the building, start the practice, design it any way you want. So I said, that sounds pretty good. I came back home and I told my wife, I said, you wouldn't believe what I just ran into when I was in Lafayette, you know. I said, there's this guy that said, uh, you know, that I could start a practice there. I'd be working, you know, they would pay me a salary uh, to get started and all this other thing. And I said, that sounds pretty good. So uh, I came, we came back a couple of weeks later, uh, both of us. And uh, they showed us around. He showed me the new building that, and he said, this is just shelled in here. And he said, that's, you, that's where you would go. You design it any way you want. It's just a shell now. We have, we don't know how to design it. Uh, so I said, "Oh, I think I could do that." You know. <laughs> so, and that's uh, that's how that happened. So it, was, it wasn't long that made that wasn't too hard a decision to make. Right. So that's how we ended up. You know. Tell us, you know, where'd you meet your wife? Tell us a little about your family. Where, where you met your wife? Yeah. Well, my, my <laughs> wife, uh, uh, I met uh, at a church camp. Uh, there was a Lutheran church camp uh, that the. Uh, 
she was about three years younger than I was, and so the college guys would uh, go back uh, to that church camp, and because that's where all the girls were, and so uh, I met her there, and then uh, she was always interested in uh, Purdue and what have you, and maybe partly because I was there or something. But uh, anyway, she would come down and visit. Then uh, we, I was probably a sophomore or a junior. Uh, in at that time, and so she would come uh, and visit uh, when we were um, uh, in, um, uh, you know, down here uh, for different things, football games, things such as that. Uh, and um, it was, um, uh, you know, sort of a interesting time at uh, you know to be together then. Uh, but uh, we also started talking about, you know, what plans that I had, and I was thinking about medical school at that time. And so, in fact, she may have been the one that gave me the money. It's like you get conflicting stories. Somebody had to give me money to take the medical school aptitude test. Uh, it may have been her, because she, she, was, she was working in her father's business, so I think she had some money. Uh, it was $25 at the time, and I really didn't have $25, so I got it from somebody. It probably was her. Uh, and so. Uh, that's how you know we got started to start talking about medical school and she actually supported the idea of uh, my going back to medical school and that sort of thing uh, so uh, you know after we got married actually I was in my second year in the army and we uh, got married when I was going into the second year in the army mm -hmm. so she uh, really worked during the entire time I was in medical school uh, I, you know, I was on the GI Bill, but that wasn't quite enough to get by on. And you didn't borrow any money. That you didn't, there were no student loans or anything like that. You didn't borrow money. I went to a bank one time and asked them about borrowing some money. This was after, actually, after I'd, I was already through my residency, and I needed a car. My car was just falling apart, and I was just gonna. I wanted to borrow seven hundred dollars, I think. And the guy at the bank said. I can't loan you any money. I said, why not? I had a job. You know, this is when I was already employed by the Arnett Clinic, when I, but I wasn't working yet. And he said, I can't loan you any money. He said, you don't have any collateral, which was true. I didn't have any. I had a car that was worth 100 bucks, maybe, at the most. Uh, he wouldn't loan me any money. So I forget where we got We borrowed it from somebody. Uh, uh, oh, I know what happened. We went to another bank uh, and with a little influence from some of the people here in town uh, that said, you, do you know who this guy is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or do you know what he's doing? And uh, I walked into another bank and the head of the bank met me at the door and he said, uh, how much money do you need? And I said, eh, 700 maybe $1,000. You could get a car for something, I don't forget, it was pretty low. And uh, he said, are you sure you don't want to buy a little better car than that? <laughs> I was going to buy a Nash Rambler, you know. So I said, well, no, I said, that'll be good enough for me. So that's what I did. So, but it, um, you know, it was, uh, times were tough uh, at that time. But she supported us all through the whole time. Yeah. So, uh, so she was a big influence on what I was able to do, not only then, but also, you know, during my entire practice. Right, and, yeah. and the work I did, you know, uh, both. Uh, at Purdue and uh, for the American Academy right. of Pediatrics. Now we want to talk a little bit about some of your things at Purdue. Um, you've been a visiting professor in chemical engineering uh, yeah. and then the biomedical as well. Right. Uh, go ahead, I'll let you Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> in, I came here in 1962 uh, and uh, starting really shortly after I came here, whenever I had some free time, I came over here trying to talk to people that I had uh, remembered were here when I was a student. Of course, that's a 10-year period there. But there were still some around, and uh, trying to get some interest or some feel about the interest in biomedical engineering, because I thought there was a combination of uh, engineering and medicine that um, uh, could be real productive. Uh, and so uh, I, I wasn't having very much luck. So about 1968, 69, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, I'm gonna probably have to go uh, talk to President Hovde. Uh, I got a little bit acquainted with him because I was uh, driving the football coaches uh, up to their um, alumni meeting there in Lake County. It was a, one of the biggest alumni groups in the country. And I would drive up there because I knew where things were up there. 
And so uh, I got acquainted a little bit with Hubdi. Then I said, I think I'm going to just go talk to him about this because nobody else seems to be paying any attention to me. And uh, she said, oh, maybe you better not do that. You know, he's pretty austere and strict. You know, he might not think too much of that. And I said, well, I might try that. Well, uh, shortly after that, uh, Bob Greencorn, who was head of chemical engineering, came into my office with his children. I was taking care of the children, and he saw my Purdue diploma on the wall, and he said, I didn't know you were, were an engineer. And I said, yeah. He said, you graduated from Purdue, too, didn't you? And he said, chemical engineering. I said, yeah. He said, why don't you come over to my office? Uh, and he said, let's talk about combining engineering and medicine. And he said, there's a field that's called uh, you know bioengineering or biomedical engineering or medical engineering he said uh, I think we should be getting started in that in chemical engineering so I came over to his office the next week and he said if I made you a visiting professor could you come over here one afternoon a week uh, and get us started in this whole area of biomedical engineering and I said oh I'd be happy to find nice that you mentioned that you know interesting you know but uh, anyway, um, that's what um, I did, and uh, I became a visiting professor in, or in chemical engineering and did a large number of research projects. Some of them were fairly small. Some of them were actually significant, nationally significant, in that uh, they called attention to various things that were going on, particularly with pediatric equipment uh, that uh, were dangerous to some extent and that needed to be uh, changed or modified, or at least people needed to be warned. So there were a lot of those things, uh, and uh, it just one thing led to another. And sure. the next, you know, within a short time, he said, "You need to teach a course in this." And I said, "Well, I, and he, I said I can only spend like an hour a week." He said, "We'll make it a one-hour course." So he made it a one-hour introductory course to biomedical engineering. He said, "You can uh, design it any way you want to." And he said, "By the way, at this time," he said we've got enough money. He said, you can invite anybody you want to as a guest speaker or, or, or anything. And at that time, I remember I wrote a letter to, uh, I never got an answer, but I wrote a letter to Neil Armstrong. I said, while we're doing this, he said, whatever you can. I thought, this would be interesting if I could get him. Well, I never got an answer from Neil Armstrong, but uh, I did get an answer from a lot of very prominent people who were working in the area of biomedical engineering. Uh, this was a relatively of, new field at that time. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Sure. But, you know, there were people at the National Institutes of Health. There was uh, a man by the name of Bob Dedrick, who was, was, became very well-known, Ken Bischoff. These were chemical engineers that were working in biomedical engineering. And so it was um, uh, a good year. I mean, that was the first year. So I had people from all over the country coming in, uh, giving guest lectures in my course, you know. So I'd give a little introductory thing the week before, and then the next week I'd have this guest lecture come in. So that uh, you know developed uh, pretty uh, rapidly, and uh, then you know about three or four years later, about 1974, a similar opportunity came up in child psychology, in that the, one of the psychologists I knew at the medical center when I was a resident uh, was here at Purdue, and that was Don Ottinger, and he came to my office and said I was taking care of his children too. Uh, he said, you know, he said there's a new field called pediatric psychology that Purdue should be started in. He said uh, there are only one or two programs in the country. Uh, and he said, uh, why don't we invite Logan Wright, who was the founder of that field, he said, we'll invite him here. He'll talk to us about it and talk to the psychology department. He said, we could probably do that. And that's what we did. So uh, I became a visiting professor of a pediatric psychology or child psychology at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, that I'm still in that area and I still teach my one hour introduction to pediatric psychology. Uh, and so that's how that got started. And then uh, about 19, so around that same time, around 1973 uh, or so, uh, 72, uh, the, there was an organization here at Purdue that was like a, almost like a club, a biomedical engineering club. Uh, and they petitioned, uh, there were probably 40 or 50, uh, mainly engineers uh, that were working in biomedical engineering, and they wanted to form a biomedical engineering center. Uh, and they petitioned... Uh, the, yeah, here at Purdue, yeah, at these Purdue, are Purdue right. people. Yeah, and they petitioned the uh, administration to do that, uh, to form a center, and the 
administration agreed to that. Uh, dean Hancock was the dean of engineering and he agreed to it. Uh, and so uh, they formed a committee to, uh, and about that time uh, the money came uh, became available from I think Showalter, uh, one of the major contributors to form a biomedical engineering center. And that's, uh, I got started with that. I was on the search committee for the head and I was also um, one of the two people that went down to the medical school to explain to them what we were doing here at Purdue in the way of forming a biomedical engineering center. There was some concern at that time that we were starting a medical school here, uh, which uh, didn't go over too well. Uh, down there, and of course we were concerned that they were getting involved pretty heavily in the engineering because they had an engineering component at what is now IUPUI. And so uh, my job with Paul Stanley, who was in Aero, uh, was to work out an agreement between uh, the two institutions, Purdue and the IU School of Medicine, uh, that was sort of a memorandum of understanding uh, that yes, we are going to start a biomedical engineering center, but this is not a you know medical school, and that uh, they were going to they were working with an organization called the Institute for Advanced Research that was doing a lot of research in ultrasound, but it was not an engineering school. Uh, but that you know any profits uh, that we would collaborate together in these areas, but any profits would be shared equally by the two institutions, and uh, they agreed to it. So, the, yeah. so that's how the Biomedical Engineering Center got started and then Les Geddes was hired uh, to be the head of that. And then, you know, the, that eventually ended up as being the center of the Biomedical Engineering School five or six years ago when the legislature was petitioned to form a new school of engineering right, here yeah, at Purdue and that yeah, was right, biomedical engineering. Right. You also had an interest in sports medicine. I want to yeah. share that with the researchers, how that came about. Yeah, well, the uh, sports medicine uh, is, was uh, a new field when I was in pediatrics, but I was interested in it, probably partially because of all the exposure I had to um, sports, uh, here, particularly here at Purdue, because I used to talk to Pinky Newell a lot because he would, Pinky would give me information as a sports reporter that the, co I mean, you didn't talk to Mullenkoff and those people that much, you know. They went, uh, you know, they didn't, you didn't interview, the, the sports editor interviewed them and that was a short interview. Uh, and so, uh, but you got to talk to guys like Pinky because Pinky had time to talk to you and he, he said, yeah, so-and-so is injured, but he's gonna be able to play. And this, uh, so I got interested in, you know, the whole area of training, sport, uh, training and what have you. And, Incidentally, Pinky was the founder of the National Athletic Trainers Association. Um, and uh, so what happened was that uh, when I came back here to practice, uh, one of the things I was thinking about was seeing, was there a way I could tie in with sports uh, and learn a little bit more about sports medicine. And, uh, you know, I, I had found this book uh, in uh, the library or in the bookstore at IU. It was the only book on sports medicine. I thought, if I'm going to do that, I better have at least one book, you know, because I, uh, you know, there were no training books or anything. So I went and bought the book, and uh, and I didn't even pay any attention to who it was written by, really. But I opened the thing up after I bought it, and it was written by uh, Malcolm Holliday, who was a family practitioner here in Lafayette, and a man by the name of Dolan, D-O-L-A-N, at Purdue in the uh, athletic department. Uh, I don't remember his specific title. So when I came here, I looked up Holiday, uh, and I looked up Pinky Newell. Well, Pinky remembered me and what have you, and so he said, I'll be glad to help you in any way that I can. And uh, Holiday said, uh, first thing he said was, I told him I had his book, and he said, you didn't buy that, did you? And I said, yeah, I bought that. And he said, oh, too bad, he said, I have a whole basement full of them. He said, they didn't sell very well. So anyway, I, uh, said, okay, well, will you at least sign my copy? So he did, and I, I think I gave that copy to Jefferson High School to their, because he was the team physician there for a long time. But uh, eventually uh, he became ill, and I, you know, I followed him around for a while. And when he got sick and he knew he wasn't going to be able to come back to work, he asked me to take over Jefferson High School, which I did uh, for a couple years until the opening came at uh, Harrison High School. 
and then I had to get someone to cover Jeff, and Dr. Underwood agreed to do that. Uh, but during that interval of time, I worked with Pinky, and he would always supply the trainers, uh, student trainers, uh, for uh, Harrison and for the other schools, too, whoever wanted to use them. Uh, he, but you had to have a physician available for those students, particularly they couldn't work independently, particularly covering any games or anything like that. Uh, the student, they could have a certified trainer with them, but if they didn't, then the physician had to be there. Uh, but Pinky always gave me the best trainers. He uh, always did. And he also gave me the first woman trainer to come out of the Purdue system and go, uh, I mean, come through the Purdue system. Uh, and that was an interesting story because uh, I always stopped in to see him, sometimes to get, to get advice, uh, sometimes just to talk. But uh, that day when I found out we had a woman trainer, I came down to the training room at Harrison and the coach said, uh, have you seen a new training room? And it had been modified, changed around and what have you. And boy, it was really clean, you know, and really orderly. Uh, and he said, have you met the new trainer? And I said, no. He said, come on in. I said, I want you to meet the trainer. And it was a woman trainer, a student trainer. And uh, I said, uh, the coach looks at me sort of smiling in the background, you know. And so I talked to him after. I said, hey, well, why didn't you tell me? He said, well, I didn't want you to get upset or anything. So I went to see Pinky. And uh, Pinky's sitting there with his feet up on his desk like he usually sat. And he said, uh, I've been waiting for you. And I said, Pinky, you could have told me that you were going to give me a woman trainer this year. He said, I didn't want to upset you. He said, besides, you told me to give you always the best trainer. She's the best one we got. So I said, OK, I can't argue with that. So, and she did turn out to be an excellent trainer. So you know, I went through, and I always used Pinky for you know, advice, and I worked with the team physicians here and uh, Denny Miller. These people have been tremendously helpful. And we've had some real successful trainers. Yeah, that's right. The head trainer for the uh, Green Bay Packers is now a, that's a Purdue trainer uh -huh. that was went through Harrison High School and went through the Purdue system and uh, actually is okay. uh, the head trainer yeah. for the Green Bay Packers. <clears throat> Let me change things a little bit. You've been the author of a number of things, but one of the things I want to ask you about is that growing child. You were the medical consultant. Yeah. And I remember that being always in the Lafayette Leader. And yeah. I remember the first time I saw it, I said, this is sort of a strange supplement. But it was, I used to read it, I mean, yeah. really. But they don't have it anymore. Yeah, that, you know, that was done by Dennis Dunn. A local thing that yeah. did very it was well. The first, it was the first uh, child development newsletter uh, in the country. So in, in that, you know, these, there are a lot of things that occur at Purdue or in this area that are firsts. Uh, and people sometimes wonder, well, why, why would you have, I mean, you would think that would be, you know, at Boston or uh, Yale or some large child development, you know, where Brazelton or someone is. But here is, you know, at Purdue University or in that area. And, of course, they did draw uh, on Purdue child development people for their sure. expertise. So when I came to town and got acquainted with Dennis Dunn, he was looking for a medical consultant for that because a lot of his things were related to, you know, things like immunizations, preventive care, uh, and he wanted to be sure that uh, Dennis Dunn was off very, very careful to be sure that from a medical standpoint that you didn't uh, do it, say anything wrong or give the wrong impression or misinform people. So uh, I would kind of review everything that came through medically, and of course a lot of it was medically oriented, or child development oriented. So I would review the things with him and then we, uh, you know, where seldom was there any real sure. controversy. But so, uh, yeah, I, well, I'm still on there. Is it, where is it being, uh, is it still being issued? Yeah, it's uh, it's being done on a subscription basis now okay. and it's in uh, electronic form. I see. There are several forms uh, that you can get it in electronically mm -hmm. by subscription and I think uh, there are some uh, news, either other newsletters or some wellness programs that uh, bring put that in as a um, supplement. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, and of course he was uh, owner of the Leader for a while, which may right. be why that appeared in the Leader. Right, that's right. Yeah, um, you were um, tell us about that advisory committee on infant mortality that you served on in the Ser Secretary of Health, uh, Health yeah. and Human Services. Yeah. Uh, you know, after I had been president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which was in 1995-96, I believe, um, 
I was uh, called upon to become a member of uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Committee on, uh, it was uh, the uh, Infant uh, Mortality Advisory Committee, it was, so it was SACIM, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality. Uh, the current chair of that committee, at the time I was asked to be on that committee, uh, had known my interest in low birth weight and the incidence of prematurity because uh, I had written, when she was president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, I had sent her a letter expressing concern uh, that the American Academy of Pediatrics and other organizations were not uh, actively pursuing that problem. So uh, what she said was, as soon as uh, I finished my presidency of the American Academy of Pediatrics, she said, I remembered what you said and now I want you to do this when you uh, join this committee. So she made me the chair of the subcommittee on low birth weight. And that uh, was uh, uh, the beginning of a long 10-year story of uh, actually looking into that problem. First of all, getting that recognized as a major problem, which it wasn't for a while, which it, it always has been for all those 10 years. Uh, but also trying to get something done at the national level through the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So that's finally, I've been on that committee, this was my 10th year, and you're only supposed to serve five. They let me on another five uh, until this project was done. The, the Secretary uh, agreed to uh, have an overall, an oversight committee that actually made um, the major recommendations as to what should be done about this problem problem and one of the things was that the uh, Surgeon General should call a nationwide meeting or a conference which will be in about three or four weeks from now uh, where they will look at this problem and then plan a research agenda to address that problem. Hmm. So it's taken about 10 years to get that right. done. But so, it's moving forward yeah, all right. along. Uh, it's right. interesting uh, bringing uh, the Purdue experience in engineering. You know, one of the things I learned uh, shortly after coming back here, coming here as a uh, professor, uh, at least uh, more active in my role as a professor after I retired from my pediatric practice, I started uh, getting exposed to uh, mathematical analysis, systems analysis, modeling, mathematical modeling, uh, predictive modeling, those things uh, that have been uh, known in industry for at least industrial engineering for many years but not applied to medical problems. So one of the things uh, that I was able to do was call attention to that among the researchers that are making the plans for this research effort that will be carried out uh, when it comes to looking at low birth weight. So the term mathematical modeling, predictive modeling, simulation modeling, those terms are now being used uh, as uh, things that we should be considering when we start looking at research programs to help solve this complex problem. So that, that was an exposure here that I knew about those fields, but I was not as impressed by them until after I found out what they could really do. Right, yes. So. Two minutes left. Two minutes? Yep, two minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. Got the awards, one, your Outstanding Chemical Engineering Award from mm -hmm. the School of Chemical, and you've gotten others, including you're an eminent engineer from Tau Beta Pi. Yeah. Those are kind of nice. Kinda right, rare. and uh, you know, it, uh, those were certainly uh, very appreciated type uh, recognitions from the engineering uh, side. Right. You know, the, uh, and I guess the other thing is that you're the president of the class of 52, and they've done very well. Yeah, the, uh, well, I, I'm the alumni uh, president right. of, of class of 52, and uh, yeah, we've done well. You know, the sculpture that's they're opposite the Creative Arts Building. That's right. uh, from the class of 52. And right. we've got a, a fairly sizable scholarship fund that was also part of the right. class of 52. Okay. So we've had some uh, notable okay. things done by. In closing, any comments, closing remarks for the researchers you'd like to share? Uh, I think uh, one of the things that has always impressed me and that I would like to pass on to probably uh, the students right. and to maybe future generations is. Uh, the significance or the importance of the uh, Purdue experience and the uh, background. You don't realize that all the time, although I realized it fairly early, particularly when I started looking for jobs and particularly when I got into the armed forces 
and particularly when I got into medical school, and there were certain aspects of the study of medicine that were easy or easier because of the engineering background. So, uh, you know, I think the students need to be impressed. Well, not only do you learn these things that are going to get you a good job, uh, well-paying job and that sort of thing, but it gives you sort of a way of thinking or analyzing problems that is unique. And I think Purdue probably has done better at doing that than any engineering school in the country. I'm, I'm biased maybe a little bit, uh, but uh, in my experiences in talking to students from other areas, other schools, I think I'm impressed with the fact that Purdue is a very down-to-earth, applied type school that gives you that kind of a background that's right, extremely right. important. was well, important to me, right. and uh, I'd like to transmit that to the, the current students and the future students who might be right. viewing this. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hannum. I appreciate this. You're welcome. Thank We're you. Happy to do this. <clears throat> My pleasure.